what I wanted to say is that I spent my career struggling with this question. Um, my last 10 years, I said, the question that's below this is your question. That is, can I do this without intentional talk? Um, and this is why I've moved down to a question about origins of life, about what I would say is, how is it that I can ascribe information to a molecule? This, uh, we do it all the time. Yeah, and and, and how can you build that up? And, you, and in your description, you, you, you helped yourself to this word representation. No, I don't. I want to be clear you that my not, yeah, that, look, I'm doing a shortcut here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. But the real question is I want to take the concept of information that we've yeah. taken from a very simple sense of information and to build it up big enough so we can talk about this notion of reference or aboutness, however you want to call it, and significance or the normativity feature of it. Um, I think you can only do it by using the Shannonian model and amplifying it with the concept of work. Um, and, and, and I think, I think it's... I think it's basic. I'm not sure we're going to get to this. If that succeeds, that will answer my question. I know it. I Shannon sorry. Weaver information plus uh, Newton's. So no, let me pounds let me just walk totally you through. Non-intentional. So let me just walk you through a little piece of it, so you get a sense well, of what I'm after. We don't have time now. But. Okay. No, I'm not going. I won't give you the whole question. But the, the simple question I asked is for Shannon, information. There's the the original entropy of a signal, and then there's what he calls the message entropy. And if the message entropy is lower than the original entropy, the, the possibilities of signal, uh, you have some law, reduction of uncertainty. That's his measure. Mm -hmm. But what he and others have recognized, he doesn't go on to talk about it because, in fact, to quantify, you don't want to go any further than that. You get lost because how many possible references could there be? You know, this is just sort of, you might say, the ground. But as Bennett, Charles Bennett would say, um, all media all information is physical. If a medium has changed its entropy, that is, it's not spontaneous, it's dropped in its entropy, work had to have been done. It has to be an open system. So when I can say that the loss of entropy of a signal is about something else, it carries its aboutness in its constraint. And that aboutness is telling me about work that is not that signal. It is something else in that signal. And that's how we can use, so when I use the arrangement of chairs in this room um, to tell me about something, if it's in a low probability state, I know, that is, it's, if they're all turned upside down on their bottoms, for example, um, I know that something is, work has been done on that. And by virtue of the nature of that unusual constraint, I have some clues as to what kind of work was there. What else is there besides the stuff? And, and, and that's, that's the ground of the aboutness. It has to be the ground of the aboutness. I think I agree with you. It's, like, it's, like, right? it's like understanding when we find hieroglyphics about which we know nothing, we can tell there's got to be a, a decoding, right? And, 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 and if we're clever enough, we'll even find it as long as we've got enough samples, right? Well, and we've and we got to find other correlates, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. That, that's not enough. This is no, just, so Shannon is telling you what's necessary to have any information. No. And the next question is, what's necessary to have any aboutness, any reference? That's still not the interpretation story that you're after. But there's a couple of those, yeah, the final piece is, um, what, do we, what do we say when I've got something that represents something to me, but it's not information, not useful in the broad, broad sense? We say that it doesn't help me reduce any of the work I need to do. My, my favorite example is a, a jigsaw puzzle that's upside down. Um, you have no constraints except the shape. You do a lot more work, but if you turn it up right side up with the picture, you have more constraint. And that means you do less work. What I gained from having those constraints was that I saved work. And my sense is that the whole story can be told through that way. And yeah, once you begin good. doing that, you've left the story of intentionality, but you've derived in a physical sense what's accomplished by intentionality. Now, that's my five minute spiel on it, but basically what I'm trying to say is I think we can do it. I don't want to. I don't want it to be Mysterian, like you're saying. And thus will we gradually pull Alex back to naturalism. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, uh, well then, it strikes me that this, that this, this discussion you guys just had may have at least a partial analogy with the discussion that I think Dan and, and Jerry were having yesterday about using, terms, using teleological terms, let's say, in, in evolutionary biology. Um, it seems to me that you're really bothered by the use of intentional 
language terms. Uh, when you when you, you say you want to get rid of them in order to have an explanation explanation that is based yeah, on physical, go, is that not is that not no correct? Okay, well no, then I was demanding that they bottom out. In that they bottom out. Okay, yeah. fine. Um, so didn't we go through a similar story in evolutionary biology where we have an interesting concept there that there, there is a concept of, of things being for certain certain traits. Uh, uh, organismal traits are for something. They, they are teleological. But of course, that teleology doesn't imply any mysterianism. It doesn't imply any God designed things that way and all that sort of stuff. It is the result of a series of physical processes, right? But no, we, no, no. I, I, I got off that train a long time before it got to the station you just described. That's my problem. I already understand, and, I, and partly I understand from the work of Dan, from content and consciousness, and from, from Jonathan Bennett, linguistic behavior, that meaning is ultimately teleological. Mm -hmm. And that's yes. Yes. my big problem, because I once I know. recognize that there is no teleology, I'm pretty well committed to the claim that there is no meaning. But why are you, sorry, why are you committed to the claim that there is no teleology? Because there's only blind variation and environmental filtration. And this brings us back to an issue that we talked about 24 hours ago, mm -hmm. right, the question of you know, the glass half empty or half full. Mm -hmm. did, New did Darwin make purpose safe for naturalism, mm -hmm. or did he expunge it from the naturalist's universe? And mm -hmm. I think he did the latter, and Dan think thinks he did the former. So, think, so yeah. I'm correct that there is an analogy there, that, that it does go, there is a, right, it does go to a twist in a teleology, so it's similar to the discussion we were having yesterday, more and since an I accept it's teleology. more than an analogy. It, it's the actual question, it's the actual thing. Yeah. And so I don't seem to be as bothered by what bothers you, because I actually do accept teleology, yeah. I don't think Darwin yeah. did anything exactly. like that. Okay. Yeah. Well, that clarifies things yeah. for me, at least. Okay. Except that if we can get meaning, if we can get intentionality to ground out in your way. Yeah, that would circumvent this problem. The, go, See, that's right. the analysis of why we're going to fail that I give has to do with that. But I'm prepared to, and in fact, I will be the first to stand up and salute when the program achieves its goal. Right. And, and I think it's important for our for the philosophy of naturalism. In fact, it's one of the most important components of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But now I'm confused because I thought you had said that Darwin had showed that you think they're the That's same result. So that is, you know, Darwin got rid of teleology and therefore he got rid of all intentionality, including um, aboutness yeah. and the way that we require it. Mm -hmm. So don't you? It sounds like you no, so now have <clears throat> grounds for no, no, no. no so, so if you, if we can if we can provide an alternative account of intentionality yeah. that doesn't involve teleology, then I'll be prepared to buy it. And if we can provide an account, uh, if we can make it, if we can, if someone can convince me that I'm just wrong about the nature of reality, that there really are purposes out there. They're just what Darwin in my view, substituted for them, then that'll work. See, the, reason, the reason a story like Terry's is going to be crucial here yeah. is because when you know, one of the when original naturalistic accounts of meaning right, had this problem, the so-called problem of error. Right? If something means something, you've got to be able to say under what conditions it might be, exactly. right. it might be used wrongly. The disjunction problem is and, 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 right. and one of the And in the 80s, one of the ways, one of the standard ways in which people tried to solve that, to, to solve that problem of error, was, in, and this is Alex's problem, question begging really, because one of the ways people tried to solve that error was by so-called teleosemantics, yeah, that and, is by and, and the referring to teleosemantics proper is, is function. Content consciousness. And so, 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 but that's also why if Terry, if Terry can convince Alex that a story like his um, does the trick, Right? Then we don't need teleosemantics to solve the question begging teleosemantics to solve the problem of error. So now we've got naturalized meaning. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't matter how we now now the question about how to read Darwin really is just a a, a question of what to say, right? Because then you, you, you could just look at Darwin from upside down or look at Darwin right side up, it doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? And and that's and, 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 and we brought Alex back from the cliff. <laughs> you know, Kierkegaard says about cliffs, sometimes you don't know whether or not 
you're scared because you're going to fall or you're scared because you're going to jump. I think uh, Alex jumped in his last book. Um, uh, but so, so I think I, you know. But I, I actually am getting a little confused by uh, some of this now too, like Rebecca. So what's wrong with saying, back to the what's real, oh, humans have purposes, for example. I mean, psychological purposes. So it's a perfectly legitimate psychological um, phenomenon. What, what, what's that? Well, you can't say that humans have purposes unless you prepare to give a account of how humans represent that bottoms out in a no, non-intentional no, 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 no. account. Got, I'm going more simply than you. Oh, okay. I'm just saying it's part of the manifest image yeah. that humans right, right, have right. purposes, sure. like yeah. humans have values and people, yeah. humans have intentions, not yeah. semantic ones. And then, uh, and we use language to represent, and language has meaning. These just seem like the phenomena that one ought not to um, eliminate. And I, I get puzzled by when you say things like um, uh, that. The, I mean, you, you. It sometimes sounds like you. The fact that Peirce and Quine didn't give us a satisfactory theory of naturalistic meaning. I mean, first of all, they didn't have neuroscience, and um, if, if what, what you know. It, it seems that you still want us to eliminate or reduce intentionality, whereas the Jackendorf project is to explain it. And that seems very different to me. Am I still wrong? In other words, yeah, yeah, it just seems to me that, An for explanation example, is fine with me, provided the explanation doesn't beg the question by invoking intentional notions. Doesn't sneak any homunculus in there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't put any undischarged homunculus. Yes, undischarged. Well, of course, undischarged. Exactly. undischarged. Right, but right. You're, are you willing to wait and see now? Follow Rebecca's idea that we're early in this, and um, I think that that you're that you do not do Quine sufficient credit by suggesting that it was his or everyone's ignorance of neuroscience back then that led him to the doctrine of radical interpretation. Well, one of the things that we get, I think. I think we're just going to leave the non-philosophers behind here. The, the radical <laughs> Sorry. indeterminacy of radical interpretation. Yes, um, hmm. I, did, I did think twice before saying yeah, it. Uh, it was the shorthand for answering uh, Owen. So there's this... There's Quine has this wonderful... Well, no, you're, you're the student of Sorry, that, let so. me add one more thing just to get the historical picture complete. Right? I'm not going to say anything about the indeterminacy of uh, the, 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 a really important book that nobody read in the late 80s, right, which exactly made the point about how you need um, the, a, 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 how you, you need a Terry type story you need, uh, uh, to, to rescue teleosemantics from being question begging was Dan Lloyd's book, Simple Minds. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yes, sure. Right? I agree. That was, there was, every, all the have read that book. Yeah. It's great. In, any, in any case, I don't know that we want to go. I think there. I, I had second thoughts about <laughs> trying to characterize. Well, there, it might be possible to do it dead simple. Um, first, let me compare two views, and you can see if you can see the difference. My view with Fodor's. Fodor says if you want to know whether something is a believer, look in its head and see whether or not its mental, its brain states <laughs> represent beliefs. Intentionally, yeah, that is so. If you want to, you know, the question is, you know, is this a believer? Is that a believer? Is he a believer? Am I? Where are the believers here? He says, look in the head and see if the states of the brain represent beliefs. If yes, you got a believer. If no, no. I say just the opposite in a certain way. I say, if you want to know whether states in the brain represent beliefs, beliefs, see whether or not they are in the head of a believer. And that's, you have to see what a believer is in order to understand how the states in that brain can represent things like the shopping list and so forth. And so that the, the concept of the intentional system is prior to the concept of the belief because beliefs are states of intentional and, and systems. And Klein's point, which no. gets uh, elaborated and taken over by Jerry who thinks it's his own, is that there is no unique sentence that can be attributed to the belief state of the believer, no matter how much we know about the believer's no, that's, behavior. That's not right. Quine's view is that we could have two 
theorists, two observers, who take Dawn. They study him left, right, and sideways. They both consider him an intentional system. They both consider his brain to have states that they can interpret as beliefs. However, there's always a theoretical possibility that they might arrive at different Rosetta Stones for his brain. They might arrive at different catalogs of beliefs for Don's brain, and in the limit, there would be no question about one of them of the being matter. right and one of them being right. wrong. There simply would be no fact of the matter, and the important thing to recognize... It's not an epistemic point. The important thing to remember about this is that uh, he's not saying this is a practical problem. He's saying it's an in-principle possibility. In the actual world, we don't have to worry about this because, a word because it's Terry likes, the constraints are so overwhelmingly large that the chances of two observers ever coming up with significantly different translation manuals for his brain states is essentially zero. The yeah. fineness of grain that we need for interacting with one another does not require us to individuate beliefs down to unique propositions, yeah. right? right? But that is a point about practicalities of life. 